Today's class is a review, briefly, of what we did last week, because we're just phasing in the new approach to the large classes. We have several classes now that have 60 students. And second of all, this is an OER CC class, uh, the first one at NDU. Can someone tell me what OER stands for? Open, source. Open Educational Resources. Well known, for example, at universities like uh, MIT or Stanford, MIT especially, for those of you who are engineers, a lot of you are, all of their courses are online. CC? Commons. Creative Commons. The idea is from the medieval European concept of the village commons. The village commons, and this existed in Lebanese villages as well in the past, there was an area of land used for grazing cattle or sheep or uh, donkeys. Uh, there was an, also for farming that belonged to the village. And everybody could use it equally. And so the idea of a creative commons is to put data, be it software for computers, be it music, film, whatever, online. So the Creative Commons initiative, you know, you've, you're familiar with this, which means copyright, obviously. CC means that the open source content of all sorts goes online and you can use it for free. I'm not going to go into that in much detail now, we'll deal with that somewhat later. But the OER is a new concept being introduced in the MENA region in the Middle East, North Africa. You all know what MENA means. Middle East, North Africa. And so MENA OER is now being phased in gradually. NDU is the first university in Lebanon to do it. So very briefly, let's sum up our reading for last week. And then let's go over the assignment for this week. You all have a syllabus, I hope. If you don't, it's both on Blackboard. And if you're registered in this course, you have access to the course on Blackboard. And as, you, as most of you now know, there's also a Facebook group. Uh, be aware of the fact that some people who took the class in previous semesters didn't leave the Facebook group. So the interesting discussion we're having on uh, animal rights is actually somebody who, intro who, who introduced it from last, year's, or last semester's course who's active in that field. So uh, I mean, there's no uh, issues here, but there, a lot of students find this interesting and they continue on several semesters. Even some of them graduate and they still stay in the course group uh, because they find the discussion interesting. So you can find the syllabus on both. Uh, the reader is at Malik's. You are expected to come to class every day with the reader. The readings up until now have not been in the reader. As of Thursday, we will be dealing exclusively with readings in the reader because they're not online accessible. So just very briefly, what are some of the major points in the article on ethics and leadership as it relates to sports? Can somebody say what were some of the key things we went over in this article uh, from the University of Florida by Susan Mullane? There was one issue that was very, very essential, which we'll be using again and again, and you'll be also using for your papers. What, what was it? Whistle, okay, whistleblowing, but that something, whistleblowing is an example of an ethical issue, but there were four, four dilemmas, and what was the term that was used? There were categories of dilemmas, they were, no, but what were, paradigms. You're all familiar with that term, I mean, you've probably heard it. Paradigms are general categories of the way you see things. I'm not going to go into the history of paradigms, but the author calls them four paradigms because these are broad categories of dilemmas. And what are they? Can someone run through them? Does someone want to give it a try? Okay. Well, just one. Long-term good versus short-term good. Sometimes something will be good for you short-term, but bad for you long-term, or vice versa for that matter. Truth versus loyalty. Should I be loyal to my boss, to my party leader, yes. and say whatever he says? Yes, obviously. Yeah. Or should I say the truth? truth? Both of them are good. Both of them are, they're both mutually exclusive, which means you can't have 
one and the other at the same time. Individual versus community. Individual versus community and this is one of those that is strongly culturally embedded. Cultural context. When, when you go to the valleys in Lebanon where you see that the water has cut away the rock, you see layers of rock, and in the rock you see stones and fossils which are embedded, they're in the bedrock or they're in the layers between the rock. That's what embedded means. That's the context that we, which, in which we see things. And here, it's very important in the Middle East and other parts of the developing world or recently developed world that group interests are basically automatic. People will see their group before they see themselves as an individual. In Europe, it tends to be the opposite. What are some of the group loyalties which are common in Lebanon or in the Middle East? Your family, obviously. The family is very, very important. And the family is not just the nuclear family, which is the father, mother, children, dog, cat, house, car. Uh, it's the larger extended family. It's the uncles and aunts and cousins and grandparents. It's a huge network of responsibility that you see yourself loyal to because they know, not only give you things, but when they get old, they expect your support in return. This is not the case in, in, in Europe where things are much more individualistic. And what you're going to notice is that the texts we're reading tend to be based on the culture of individualism. The, the basic unit in society is not a family, it's an individual person. It's a, a one person, a man or a woman. What else besides family? Family, confession is the word we use in Lebanon, which is your denomination is more common in English, which doesn't mean only Christian or Muslim, but within the Muslims, whether you're Sunni or Shiite or Alawite or Druze, and within Christian, whether you're Maronite or Orthodox, or then of course the Armenians have three, right? The Armenian Orthodox, the Armenian Protestants, and the Armenian Catholics. So if we ever have a Senate, they're going to get more seats than everybody else. Uh, okay, confession. What else? Political. Political parties. So partisan. This is important. When we use the word political in English, it doesn't mean necessarily just the parties. It can also mean other issues like the environment or women's rights can also be political. When we're talking about political parties, we say partisan, coming from partisan. Okay? And what else? No, basic loyalties, which, which are all sort of automatic. You're born into them. Communities. communities. Which, well, let's not use the word community because that can mean other things. Let's say the, the village. The village or the part of town you're from. Uh, you are defined by birth by these issues. Your family, your confession, partisan loyalties can be changed, but often are lied to the family and village. Okay. Race. Nationality in, within the country? Yeah. Well, give me an example. No, but you're not born into your, I mean, we're all, everybody who's Lebanese is, has the same nationality. That's, that's actually the problem that, na that nationhood doesn't play much of a role, as it would in in many uh, other Arab countries. Okay, so what we had a fourth one. We had justice versus mercy, and that's the one that's always brought up uh, right after the test. Uh, professors should have mercy uh, because of the situation which students are in, and sometimes it's legitimate, and sometimes it's not. Okay, what else is key in this reading? Someone brought up the issue of whistleblowers. Whistleblowers is one of the main ways that people challenge the authority and prove themselves to be disloyal because they see truth as more important. There's another, what are there some, some other important issues. What else? Uh, they talk about the dilemmas. Yeah, well, these are the dilemmas, the four dilemmas. No, I think in one, in one okay, okay, very good. The issue of the place in which you make that decision. 
Is it in the workplace? Is it in politics? Is it at the university as a student? Some of you might have heard of Bisharaf. Have you ever heard of that? What it means, dignity, right? It's an organization. Did I spell it wrong? Shut up, shut up. They spell it shut up. It's an organization for honesty in schools, universities, and in the workplace. So, Bishadov, is it an E? No, it's just, oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong. Bishadov, Bish, with a, with a, well, okay, well, 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 that's gonna go down on tape now, and unfortunately the world will see it, my spelling mistake. Okay, good, what else? Another important issue is training. You are not born ethical. That would be literally impossible because we make a distinction here between morals and ethics. What is the, can someone define morals as used in this reading and in the class in general? Morality, where does it come from? Uh, it's common sense. It's common sense, it's experience, it's the things that you sort of intuitively know. You know somehow that's right, that's wrong. That's good, that's bad. Whereas ethics is, is, is codified, is standardized, which means that there are lists of rules, there are guidelines. It goes beyond and is therefore able to be applied to different groups and different contexts or at different, in different situations of your life. So the oldest set of rules that we talked about is Hammurabi. the Code of Hammurabi, the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament, in the Quran, similar sets of rules. Ten Commandments, etc. Okay, good. And finally, let's, I gave you one example from sports, it's not in the article, but um, Lance Armstrong is well known for what? He's, he, was a, he had cancer too, yeah, and he's, he, he beat cancer and went back and became a, a successful athlete, which gave him a lot of moral recognition as a tough guy. But what was he then ultimately found guilty of? Of doping. Doping, but he wasn't just a doper. He, just, he didn't just dope for himself. What was his position on his team? He was the captain, the team captain. So this is very important when we're looking at the distinction between followers and leaders. He was an unethical leader. So the point being that ethics and skills, training, personal ability to deal with followers can be used for good or evil. And the better you get at it, the better you get at being good, or the better you get at being evil. And one of the readers, one of the uh, readings that we have by the name, the author by the name of Zimbardo, is famous for his work on evil leaders. And that's why a lot of the students like that reading the best, because it's, it's the fun one, right? About how to, be, how to be an evil leader, right? So if you want to end up being an evil leader, that's the article for you. Uh, Philip, Zimb Philip Zimbardo, okay. So uh, finally, the issue of training. We have to exercise moral courage. Being an ethical leader is partially just a cognitive, you know, cognitive from kno. You ever wonder why no has a K? It comes from the Greek. Gno, right? Like gnostic, agnostic. So, cognitive. So, cognition or knowing is one thing. Yeah? There's a wall, column, right? Okay, sorry about that. So, I'll try to get over here a little bit more. So when we're talking about ethics, the one thing is to know. The second thing is to do. There's a quote from Gandhi that you should be able to think, 
say, and do. Now, the, the, the do part is always important for leaders because they lead by, are supposed to lead by, example. So people will follow what you do much more readily than what you say. But in ethical dilemmas, what's the problem? You don't know what to do. Bravo. So, so when you have two goods, then you're faced with the decision. And if you have to make that decision based on previous examples, what's that called? You can look at other leaders. What did they do? Precedent. Precedent. Bravo. Precedent. If there's no precedent, it's unprecedented. Bravo. Uh, then what do you do? You're stuck. What do you have to do then? What, what do you have to fall back on if there's, values. bravo, the core values. You can only work with your core values and that's where we pick up in today's lecture. How do you establish core values? Because once you've made a decision of what to do based on your core values, then the next step is to actually do it and you're gonna, as a leader, you're gonna be up against a lot of resistance. So you're gonna need to practice. For those of you who are Tough sports, what are some of the toughest sports around? Like really grueling, like painful. Wrestling, who was a wrestler? Who was a wrestler besides me? I'm the only tough person in this room? Oh, bravo. And Nadine Nassif, the uh, chairman of the, uh, of the sports department, he was also a wrestler, so whenever I tell Nadine that I used to be on the wrestling team, he goes, I'm a die, right? You know, so I'm tough, right? So bike racing is also incredibly tough. Bike racing, you have no idea. Going up a hill and, 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 and racing at the same time? You, you can get killed in wrestling? We're not talking about professional wrestling. We're talking about the real thing. Okay. Um, so, why, why do you need to exercise your moral courage? What does that mean, by the way? What is, in, in English, a lot of, English has um, a lot of words that have more, more than one meaning. That's why it's easy to, or very common to, make jokes and also write love songs or rock songs in English because of the multi-layered meaning of the words. Exercise has two basic meanings. What are they? To do and to show authority. To do something, I exercise my authority. My authority in this class is to make sure that everybody in the back is quiet, so I'm exercising, bravo, I'm exercising my authority over the peanut gallery. Okay, so, but exercise also means the other thing, sports, training, training. So when we exercise moral courage, the dual meaning of that is, one, we have to be able to be courageous, but we have to practice. So what's the best way to practice something? To do it. So when you want to be able to deal with moral dilemmas and you want to exercise, what do you do? You throw yourself out into the world, into unpleasant situations, and practice. One of the things that people have a problem with if their life is easy, one of my students in, in, the, uh, in our faculty in law and political science, she has, her life is really easy. Her father is a dean, her mother's a professor, she grew, her, she, her parents are Italian and Lebanese. She's got it made, right? She's smart, she's likable. So she's in the flow of Success. What do you do when everything's just going your way? What do you expect? You expect it to always go your way, right? And will it? Yes. Well, if you're really lucky, like you're one out of a million, maybe that's true. But what do the rest of the people know is going to happen sooner or later? There's ups and downs. So people who have constantly been confronted with problems, they will know how to deal with them. So that's why athletes exercise. Exercise isn't something normal. What did people used to do before there were sports? They worked. They had heavy manual labor. That's why our diet is so heavy in calories, because we used to burn them off. Now we can't eat as much as, of the good Lebanese food as we used to, because we don't go out in the wood and, woods and cut down trees or carry bags of potatoes or grain over the mountains. Uh, we sit in an office. So we're not burning up the calories the same way. If you're in the flow of success, you throw yourself into difficult situations intentionally. So now to some of the 
issues in the two readings that we had for today. What are the two readings we had for today? Inner and outer journey of a lifetime. And building networks, living by values and anticipating change. Now the second one is really important because someone's mentioned in there that's really dear to my heart. And that's me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, can someone sort of describe the difference between the two articles, the two readings? They're very, both very short. What was the difference between the first one, which is about India, and the second one, which is about Lebanon? Okay, who can, who can sum up the first one? At least we can get that established, the first reading. Guys, okay, this is the reason everybody has to, one, come to class with their readings, and two, having read them beforehand. And it's not enough to say my neighbor has one too. You have to have them all with you, please. Can someone sum up this briefly? What, is, what are the points made in the first reading? What is the organization mentioned in the first reading? What does IFC stand for? Initiatives of Change. And Initiatives of Change has two conference centers, which some of you, we have a tradition now over the, over the last five years where students from our university and other parts of Lebanon have gone to one conference center in Co in Switzerland. It's French, it's not Cox, right? Co in French. And the other one is in S India in Panch Ghani which is near Mumbai, or it used to be called Bombay, uh, which is in the northwest of India, in the very affluent part of the country. Uh, and these two training centers have programs to teach young people to be ethical leaders. Uh, were the two handouts distributed? Yes. So, look, for those of you who didn't get the handouts, I made 45, assuming that not everybody's going to be here. So if you don't have one, share with your neighbor. One of the key, one of the key skills for exercising moral courage is personal Develop mint. Uh, guys, you do not need to talk to each other while this is being handed out. What does development mean? Growth. Growth? Gro normally it would mean development in the direction of an improvement, that you become more skilled, you become more balanced. What is the first thing that you have to be willing to do when you want to develop? Bravo, change. So, personal change normally is the first step in a journey of a thousand miles. By the way, does anybody know the saying, how do you start a journey of a thousand miles? Take the first step. It's Lao Tse in the Tao Te Ching. Tao Te Ching, you know, you know Taoism? Uh, do you know the martial art based on Taoism? Yes. Tai Chi, bravo, Tai Chi, yeah. So, one of the core messages of the Tao Te Ching is that we have to be aware of the necessity to change. So personal change, the first step, and especially if you're going to be changing in the direction of becoming a better leader, personal change means recognition of the fact that something has to be different. So what we're going to do now is we're going to compare three of the major thinkers, there are a lot more, but these are three that I thought were good for comparison. I'll get there in a second. Three ma four major thinkers with the articles that we, or the readings we have. Miriam, could you uh, intervene? Guys, this is being recorded. We need silencio. Okay, so 
the first step in the process is the, willing, the, the recognition of the fact that something has to be different, the need for change. The second is the question, and we'll be dealing with this again and again, who's responsible for a situation which I find unacceptable? Normally you want to change things because you want them to be better, which means something's not good. Now, is the non-goodness of your situation your fault, the fault of the people you're with, or the people who are ultimately responsible for the way the game is run? We, may, we talked about this previously. If it's your fault and you're doing something wrong, you're a bad person. In English, we call that a bad apple. A bad apple is, we know the comparison, you have a bowl of apples, you put a rotten apple in the bowl, what happens? It ruins the, a bad apple is a dispositional approach to things. What is your disposition? Your character, the way you do things, the way you feel. So if I say, well, you know, I'm unhappy with the situation. It must be me, so I need personal change. There's something bad or something wrong, something incomplete with the way, th the way I am. Another option would be it's the people around me. That would be a bad barrel of apples. And that is, it's not my disposition, my character, it's the Situation I'm in, right. Situational. So, I'm a good apple. I got thrown into a barrel of bad apples. What's going to happen to me now automatically? I'm going to turn bad too. Now, that's not absolutely necessary, but that's a high probability. And we, we all know this situation, and I'm not going to say any details, but you go out with some friends in the evening, and they say, this evening we're going to do X. I'm not going to say. And then you have a choice of going along with the bad apples or not going along and then you're not going to go out with them anymore because they're not going to like you. So you're tempted now to be influenced by the bad apples. But what if the situation was created in a way that it's almost impossible for anybody to be good? What do we call that? Bad barrel makers, that is systemic, bravo. So who's the best example of somebody who was very skilled at making bad barrels? Hitler, he created a situation where the, even the best people were almost unable to be good. Bad barrel makers, systemic, not to be confused with Systematic, please, <laughs> I mean, Google the two and you'll see the difference. Okay, so when we look at the two readings for today, we're, ta we're talking about young people, your age, who have decided for all kinds of reasons, and they're all from all different parts of the world, to go to the conference center in Panchgani in, in India and to spend nine months starting with themselves, which would be Looking at their disposition, I'm going to remove the word bad because it's not necessarily bad, it's just you're not happy with the situation you're in. So you want to work with your disposition. You want to have personal change. And there are two options here. You can say something has to change in me or something has to change in the situation. When we look at the situation in Lebanon, let's look at the water. We're all going to be starving, not starving, but Dying of thirst this summer. Oh, yeah. Yes, most likely. Not only do we have half the water this year that we normally do, there was a period in February where the water table was going down, although it's the wettest month of the year. Not only do we have half the water that we normally do, but we have around 30% more people. The population has gone up by over a million, which means we now have to share water with Syrian refugees, 
let alone the Iraqi ones who are already here and the Palestinians as well. But they're already factored in. So, when I'm, when I'm looking at the water situation, and I use a situational approach, what do I do? Whose fault is it? The government, the water authority, the guys who are supposed to fix the pipes. Let them take care of it. What would be a dispositional approach? Oh, what can I do? I mean, I, I, I come from Austria. I, I come from Austria. It's, Austria is a desert-like place, never rains. We have camels. No. Austria is a very wet country. It's very green because it's always raining. So if you're lucky to go there when it's not raining, it's beautiful. If, it's, if you go there, most of the time it's raining and it's sort of miserable. But what do people do in Austria? They conserve water. They have a high level of water awareness. When the water reserves go down just a little bit, the government calls the, call, rings the alarm. Everybody stop using as much water. There's never a shortage of water because they're constantly managing it, maintaining it. So. Can I act responsibly as an individual, although nobody else is? Yes. Yes, I could. So can you change your personal approach to water use yes. without the rest of the world doing it? Yes. Right. OK. But would that really change much? No. no. So what we have to do is we're not saying that you should just do personal, just do situational, or just do systemic. We're saying that it's a question of where you start as an individual. So, who would say the best place to start is uh, systemic, which would mean the whole system, the confessional system and the history of Lebanon with the millet system with the Ottomans and the Arabs. Are we going to change the system? That's, that's sort of like hopeless, right? So we won't, we're not going to start here, no. Nope. Situ most people would say situational. We need the government, the parties, the religious leaders, to act responsibly, and then we can fall in line. Now, how old, if you're, if you're like 20, 25, when was the last time that happened? <laughs> it's, so, you know, the way I quit smoking was the following. I quit smoking eight times. Eight times? Eight times. And after the seventh time, I thought to myself, I'm always doing the same thing, and I'm getting the same results. And I, and I learned that actually from Alcoholics Anonymous. Not that I was an alcoholic, I was an, I was an addict to another drug called nicotine. So, I heard from Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous. By the way, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by people from Initiatives of Change back in the 30s. And they said, if you keep on doing the same thing and you expect different results, you're crazy. So, look what you're doing the same and change it. So, what was I doing? I was going out and having some fun and drinking and smoking and the next day, you have a nicotine overdose. So what do you do? You, you quit smoking because you can't take the cigarettes. You can't take the nicotine. So what do you do next? You decide to quit. Two days later, four days later, you're still quit. Five days later, the desire comes back. What happens? You start smoking again. So. Now I forgot, the, the, the lights brought me off track. What was I talking about again? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, do we start with the situational or the dispositional? If, if we keep on assuming that the situation is going to change, we're crazy. We've seen this enough times already. What, what can we change? We can, we can change ourselves. When students say, I couldn't write my paper because I didn't have enough time, that means that they have less than 24 hours as opposed to the students who got their paper done. What does that mean, I don't have enough time? They have other things to do, which is a question of priorities. We all have 24 hours. What the student's actually telling the professor is, I had things to do with my time which are more important than you, which is not what you want to tell your professor, right? You all have enough time. You chose to do something else. Don't, don't think that we're not the same. I always, when I do papers for books or journals, I'm very well known for being very late. And the people who know me, they already give me like a date that's a month or two before it's actually due. 
Say, oh, it's sensing again. <laughs> We're going to tell him it's due in April when it's actually due in June, right? So by, the, by, by June, he'll probably be done. So I'm like this too, but just be aware of the fact you can make a decision to change this. So for those of you who read the reading for today, or the readings, what was the first thing that the people decided to do who took the training? To change themselves, and what was the first thing you do when you started changing yourself? You start reflecting, thinking about what, what you would like to be different. You write these things down, and you start working on them one by one. And the article, both articles, make a point of a method that's used to do this, and now I want you to take out the handouts. Which one? The one, this one here, Ethics and Leadership. And we have Franco Bernabe, Dag Hammarskjold, and Martin Luther King. Uh, Franco Bernabe is still alive, he's a very, we'll be reading about him in one of the readings a very, very successful Italian entrepreneur who was head of the largest petrochemical corporation in Italy called Eni. He was also head of a Telecom Italia and other major corporations. And he was very well known for turning companies around. Government owned companies similar to the very successful Lebanese company called EDL. You all know that one, right? That's the other problem, electricity, right, along with water. And he took over companies in Italy, similar to EDL, and he turned them around. In a very short period of time, he made them profitable and responsible. And so what was his secret? His secret was that he first worked on himself. And once he started on the path of personal change, he used a trick or a mecha me mechanism or a method called solitudine which is Italian for, <laughs> for solitude, which means he would sit down every day on a regular basis and do nothing. I bet some of the students in this class could actually be quiet for five minutes. <laughs> what, you try to do, <laughs> what you try to do is to sit down, or what he did is sit down for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, every day on a regular basis and listen to what came to mind, something that he did as a successful corporate leader. What do you do when you're training, when you're exercising? What's the purpose of exercising on a regular basis instead of doing it like, if you go out and play tennis for three hours, you're doing your body more harm than good. Why? You're overwhelming yourself. You're, you're tearing down your muscles. What's better is to exercise 20 minutes, 30 minutes, every day. So it's important to do this every day. So we'll be dealing with this example in one of the readings. The second one is Dag Hammarskjöld. Dag Hammarskjöld is somebody who you'll like because Dag, Dag Hammarskjöld was the second general secretary of the UN and as we all know the UN is impartial and unbiased, right? <laughs> okay, so this is why I like to bring him up. Dag Hammarskjöld took over the UN when it was strongly under the control of the United States. And guess who was unhappy about that back in the 50s? The Soviet Union, right? As we were, we're getting, you know, history is now coming back full cycle. So the Russians, the Soviets, which is not the Soviet Union, because most of the leaders of the Soviet Union were not Russian, and they didn't use their mobile phones in class either. Uh, and so the Soviets are somewhat different than the Russians, but what they hoped would happen if Hammarskjöld did not do the bidding, did not dance to the tune of the Americans, what did they want him to do? To be with them. To be with them. And what did Hammarskjöld say? He said, no, I'm going to create a UN which is a third power. We have the Soviet Union, which is a huge block of countries. We have the United States, which is a huge block of countries. And the UN is going to be the third party, which meant that the Americans and the Russians loved him. No. Wrong. Wrong, right. So what we see here is, Dag blah, 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 Hammarskjöld, and I'm pronouncing it wrong, was a Swedish diplomat and he served until his death. Mysteriously, his plane crashed in Africa. 
mysteriously. And nobody knows how. And to this very day, we can't figure out why his plane crashed. So as a good Lebanese, you go, oh, we're not. <laughs> well, it's got to be either the Russians or the Americans. Or one, maybe once they got together and agreed on something. Maybe. Anyway, so we, 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 we now know who it was, right? Anyway, Hammerskjold did something similar to Barnabe called the inner voice. He listened to the inner voice and he, um, he would do the exact same thing. The inner voice was not just something that was speaking, he was dialoguing with it. What does dialogue mean? It means dia and wrong, 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 wrong. Dia and logos. Inner dialogue is different than just listening to your inner voice. Inner dialogue, log means word, logos, right? The word or talk or, or dia is not the same as d. D means two. Dia means across or through. So dialogue means through talk you achieve something different. It's not, it's, it's not like a dialogue is two. If you have three, then it's a trialogue. And, uh, people do that. But it's, a dialogue means through talk, reaching a new level of understanding. So what he's trying to do, or what he propagates in the reading, we'll have a whole reading, if you look at the reader, a whole reading on his concept of becoming a ethical leader. And he ultimately, play, ultimately paid the highest price by sacrificing his life. The third one, and this is the one you all learned about in school, the guy, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was not only a Protestant priest, which is called a assis in Arabic, right? Pastor. Um, but he was also a political organizer, and he was very well known for finding peaceful ways of dealing with violence. So let's have a look now at what he writes, he was in jail. Does anybody know the story of Martin Luther King and why he ended up in jail? Yeah. Why? Well, that's not enough. What was the actual charge? Conspiracy. Conspiracy because what he had done was the blacks in the U.S. were required to go to areas that were reserved for blacks and couldn't go to the areas where the white population lived. Similar to South Africa. We'll be also reading about South Africa. In South Africa, they ended up having two bus systems. One's for blacks, one's for whites. In the US, they did it differently. The front of the bus is for the whites, the back is for the blacks, and because rich people don't tend to take the bus, the front of the bus was always half empty, and the back of the bus was always crowded. So, what, they, what the civil rights movement did was to set a trap for the white government. They said, we're going to have a woman who's well, who's well, well trained. She didn't just so one day decide, Hollis, I'm tired of this. This woman was trained. And she sat down on the front of the bus and refused to get up. She was black, obviously. And then she was arrested. And then, they, then the next day, they organized a boycott of all the buses in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Now, for that to work instantaneously, it's not, it's not spontaneous. This was planned. This was a long, thought out conspiracy, if you will. And, be, and what happens to a bus system where the buses are driving around with around 20% of their usual capacity? They lose money and they go out of business. So he was charged with conspiracy, he's in jail, and he reflects now on this famous letter, how should we fight this obvious injustice? And the fighting part is the part that we're all aware of. So what's the first step if we're going to have a nonviolent campaign against Injustice. We're going to go out and fight. But before we go out and fight, what's the first thing that we do? To protest. That's the same thing as going out and fighting. You don't have the handout? Yeah. So look, let's share. What's the first thing you do? You have to know your situation. Some of you are Armenian or have Armenian friends, and we know that next year is a big year for the Armenians in Lebanon. Why? 100th anniversary or the commemoration, it's not a celebration, of the genocide. 
the attempt of the Ottomans, who are dearly loved by the Lebanese population as well, right? Right? No? Yeah, your love? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think one thing everyone has in common is they didn't really think the Ottoman rule was that beneficial. A large numbers of, our, of Lebanese died in Lebanon of hunger at the end of, the, of World War I as well. We know that. So the difference was that the uh, Ottomans attempted systematically to exterminate the Armenian citizens of their own country. These, was, these were not foreigners. These were citizens of the Ottoman Empire, just like everybody else. So if you were following Martin Luther King's suggestion here, and you were going to work on the genocide issue, what, was the what would be the first thing you need to do? Know the facts. So I'll, I'll, I often like to ask my students, what is the Ottoman justification for what they did? What's their excuse? They were a conspiracy. Who was a conspiracy? The, the, the Armenians were conspiring. That's not even a full sentence. What, the Armenians were conspiring, conspiring to do what? To attack the Ottoman Empire all by themselves. With who? Who were they conspiring? Russia, bravo. The Armenians were conspiring with the Russians. And what was going on, going on at that time? World War I. And who was fighting whom? The Ottomans were fighting Germans. together on the, on the side of the Germans and the Austrians against and Russia and Russia. So if the Ottoman, if you take the, the, if you take the uh, Armenian population and you put a border between Russia and the Ottoman Empire and the Ar Armenians are on both sides, it might make sense to assume that some of the Armenians are conspiring with the enemy. So that's the official excuse. So, was this the only case that happened in World War I? No, no. Of this kind of claim? No. no. You, you know by, well, by now that you're supposed to say no, but does anybody know of any other examples? Yes. Which one? In, uh, Lebanon. Where a population was divided by a border where the two, <laughs> World War I, No. The World War One. No, World War One. The example was the 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 frontier, the 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 battlefields between what was then Austria Hungary and Russia. You had Galician, which are Ukrainians, on both sides. Ukraine's back in the news, right? You had Ukrainian populations, Ukrainian Catholic populations, and Ukrainian Orthodox populations. But the issue was these were also Catholics, because the Catholics were allied with the Austrians. And you had Jews, or Ukrainian Catholics, Ukrainian Orthodox, and Jews on both sides of the frontier. And at the beginning of the war, the Austrians were losing. So guess who they blamed? The Jews and the Ukrainians. And later on, the Austrians were winning, so guess who the Russians blamed? The Jews, the Jews and the Ukrainians and Catholic and Protestants. And so what did the, Ju the Russians do and what did the Austrians do as a response to this threat? They, uh, they removed the entire population on both sides of the front. Sound familiar? So how do you do that if you're not intending on killing them? You take them to train stations. You put them on cattle cars, not, not first class, obviously. Uh, you put them on cattle cars, and you transport them deep into the interior of your country, put them in concentration camps, that's what they were called. And at the end of the war, what do you do? Send them home. And that's what the Russians and the Austrians did. That's what deportation means. What did the Ottomans do? They told them to walk to Syria. And they, most of them died. OK. So these are the kinds of, this is the kind of research you need to do before you even move forward. So Martin Luther King says, know your history. Next step. Negotiate. You negotiate, you dialogue. So you say, okay, to the other side. So the 14th of March could say to the 8th of March. 
<laughs> this is our position. Let's dialogue. What's going to be the result of that? Okay, we, have a, we need a new government, right? And we want to have a, a declaration of intention of the government, a platform for the new government concerning the role of the resistance, right? And there are two positions. And it's sort of like nobody can agree. So what's the role of dialogue? You have, you, have, you have your position, you try to find common ground. And what happens if it doesn't work? You try to dialogue again. And what happens if it doesn't work? What does Martin Luther King say? What does Martin Luther King say? What does he say? Self-purification. Okay. What does that mean? What does self-purification mean? Impurities, thank you. <laughs> That's a, that is a typical B-R-R-E answer. What's big, red, and eats rocks? A big red rock eater. Don't use the, don't use the word you're defining in the definition. So what does self-purification mean? Remove the bad things from, from yourself, from, in this case, look at your motivations. Okay, I'm on the 14th, I'm on the 8th, I was over at the potato stand today at NDU, and I said, I want to buy some potatoes. They said, sir, you can have them for free. You're on our side. Huh? <laughs> Do you think they can buy me with some potatoes? <laughs> But I, I, I said, should I, take the should I take the potatoes for free or not? <laughs> so the next time the, the other side has a stand, I'll go over and get some free food too, right? So, <laughs> so self-purification means you go through your motives. Okay, I, it was a joke, so you can laugh a little bit. You go through your motives and you try to clean them out of anything that's not focused on what you're trying to do. So if I'm an Armenian and I'm fighting with the Turks about the genocide and the fact that they will not admit that it even happened, is that the only thing I'm doing? Or am I mixing in some other mo emotions like anger at my father or anger at my teacher? Or is it just revenge or is it something else? The way I fight, can it be different? Can I, f can I fight with a pure heart or can I fight with a polluted heart? where I'm mixing things. A lot of people, when they're fighting a good fight, they bring in other issues, like their experience with their teacher or their experience with their parents. Because I'm fighting oppression, and the oppressors are the Turks, my parents, my priest, my school teacher, and the mayor. <laughs> and I'm going to put them all together. Does that make you better or worse at fighting what you... It, it can make you better how? It'll give you lots of power, right? Give you lots of power, right? But it'll give you polluted power, somehow. Okay, so in case, we don't have to agree with Martin Luther King, but what does Martin Luther King do? He say, we're gonna go out now, and we're gonna demonstrate against the white government, which says we cannot use the schools, we cannot use the buses, we cannot use the parks, and when we get out there and we demonstrate, they're gonna come with water cannons, well, they were actually hoses at the time, they didn't have water cannons, they're gonna spray us with water and knock us over, and then we're going to get back up, and they're going to do that three times, and they're gonna, then they're going to come with dogs, and then the dogs are going to bite us, and what are we going to do? Stand there and do nothing. Does that need training? Yes. Yeah. The famous example is of Rachel Corey. Her name is not Kuri. She's not Lebanese. Some, some of my Lebanese say, oh, Rachel Kuri. Oh, she must <laughs> Rachel Corey. <laughs> who is an American activist, and she was in Gaza, and when the, when the Israelis were still there, they would come and say, these houses are now for the Jews, this area is for the Jews, we're going to knock down the houses of the Palestinians. And so what these foreign activists did is they stood in front of the bulldozers. Yeah, and then one day a guy didn't see her. And he kept on getting closer and closer, and he ran over and killed her. Does that need training to stand there? Okay. So what Martin Luther King is saying is not that you shouldn't fight, but you should use nonviolent methods and you should have a pure heart. So, now these are all different people. This is the head of the UN, this is the corporate leader, this is a civil rights leader in the US, 
And the th last example is the example we're having from, from today's readings, which are a bunch of young people. A lot of them are NDU students who are in the second article. But we also have someone by the name of Wadia Kuri, this time it is Kuri, uh, who, who's from uh, Sakhle, who did this training in India. And so the first thing they're trying to do is work on themselves, the same way that Barnabe, Martin Luther King, or Hammarskjöld would do, to transform their inner thinking. And the second thing is then to go out and fight the good fight. So keep that in mind. It's not about being a wuss, being a wimp, not fighting. It's about fighting better with a, with, with a focus. OK. Now, what is the homework for Thursday? OK, you all have the syllabus, which is, uh, which is this, right? You all have the syllabus? And you all have the reader. Now, if you go on Blackboard or Facebook, you'll find the syllabus. You'll also find the cover of the reader. The reader has hyperlinks, which means you can access through the cover of the reader online. Now, I know that in a matter of a year or two, you'll be able to take your cell phone over your reader and actually, but that hasn't happened yet. So being able to download stuff with your cell phone, that's a couple of years off. But that's going to happen soon. So what you need to do is to read the first reading in the book for Thursday, which is Ethics of public service. You all got it in your reader? We're not done yet. Yeah. OK. I got a response from uh, Fadi Kumer's assistant saying it's OK for the students who are going to his class to come five minutes late. I, I now <laughs> but they're not in the old campus. You need 10 minutes to get to the old campus. You don't need 10 minutes to get to a room in this campus. So Fadi Kumer knows you're coming five minutes late. The rest of you can get from here to there. And if you have to smoke, maybe you'll have to go without cigarettes for five hours. OK. Drink water. I have some water with me. You thirsty? Yeah. <laughs> so let's take out the second. Keep on the first reading. What is cross-cultural cognitive dissonance? Have, you've all heard the word. You've all heard the word dissonance before. It's the it's the opposite of harmony. It's the opposite of imbalance. Now, cognitive dissonance is. Who wants to read it? Someone got a good voice. Who wants to read it out loud? Loud. No. Oh, this doesn't work. Now I have to read it because I have the I have the mic. Okay. In psychology, excuse me, guys. In psychology, cognitive dissonance is the excessive mental stress and discomfort experienced by an individual who holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time. Cross-cultural cognitive dissonance is the result of living in a culture, living in a society, where you have conflicts between cultural norms and understandings which are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means you can't have both. Either it's the one or the other. They cancel each other out. So in Lebanon, we all know that the largest cleavage, the cutting line in society is confessions, religious groups. And these Religious groups are mutually exclusive. There are things about Islam which make it unacceptable for Christians. And there are things about Christians which make it unacceptable for Muslims. Within the confessions, there are often also con contradictions. For example, Protestants had a 30-year war with Catholics over the question of the, one of the questions was the role of the Virgin Mary. I mean, is it worth killing people for 30 years? to decide whether Mary was the mother of God or not. But people did it. So there's other parts of the world which have similar problems. But Lebanon is well known for these mutually exclusive cultural, religious norms. So 
one of the advantages you have being Lebanese is that you automatically grow up with these cross-cultural cognitive difficulties, this dissonance, this inability to have harmony. So what do people do in Lebanon when they're constantly confronted with these conflictual situations? Hmm? Civil war? No, I mean, I haven't, I've been here for 15 years. I mean, well, they try to negotiate it. They try to live with it. The skills you develop to navigate, to live with, to balance out these uh, cultural conflicts is a skill that you will need as a leader. It's one of the core leadership qualities that are now needed around the world because we're now living in a global world. So keep that in mind. The cult cultural, cross-cultural cognitive dissonance along with significant adversity are the two things you can do if you're in the unlucky situation to be in the flow of success. If you know anybody, or it's you, whose life is just fine, everything's going my way, you're like an athlete who's not pushing himself or pushing herself. So what do you do? Some people, I had a friend, he was good at every sport. I hated him. He used to go to sport. Oh, he's great. He was, he was never the best. He'd be like the third to the top. But he didn't even, he didn't even train. He'd just go out, let's play tennis. Oh, he'd be the third best. Not even trying. we go, let's go football. Oh, same thing. <laughs> no one wanted to play with him because he'd always be good without trying. So this is what we call the flow of success. So what does somebody like that do if they realize this is a weakness? They go out and put themselves in adverse, in adverse situations, in difficult situations. And they also try to find out what's wrong with their cultural understandings that makes them think that everything's just fine. There, there are more ways than one of seeing the world. OK, so let's have a look now at the thing that's going to be really important when you're reading this upcoming article. We've talked a little bit about pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional ethics. Does anybody remember who developed this concept? Of pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Lawrence Kohlberg developed an idea, the concept, remember we have children and inf infants and, and animals, then we have people who just respond and obey rules, and then we have people who actually internalize the rules. Remember this? So, pre-conventional is not being aware, not having reached the level of cognitive development. I can't really understand rules yet. Small children are like this, infants. I gave you the example of my daughter who always would take the glasses. She liked glasses because they go like this, right? Yeah. And she'd go like this. Gank, 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 gank. <laughs> so I told my wife, no, we're not going to take them away from her. We're going to put them on the table and say, Noor, no. So what does she do? She puts a piece of paper in front of the glasses and goes for them, not knowing a, as a nine-month-old child that I can see her shoulder, right? Uh, so, she was right at the edge of going from pre-conventional to conventional. Pre-conventional, when I come home, I hear, when I put the, the key in the lock, I hear kapunk. That means the cat's jumping off the table. The cat knows if I catch it on the table, it's going to get whacked. So this is pre-conventional ethics. Cats know, dogs know, small infants, you know, after a few months, they know certain things will lead to pain, other things will lead, lead to rewards. The shift from pre-conventional to conventional is when I don't need those automatic punishments and rewards, I understand the rules. Why can cats and dogs never understand the rules? They can't understand in the first place. They don't have awareness. Now, 
Infants obviously have awareness, but it's not very developed. But when, you're, when you reach the level that you can actually talk about rules, that means you're moving from pre-conventional to conventional. This is the Kohlbergian approach. So the second step is conventional, which means conventional conventions are norms, are codes. It's the codification of morals. When I'm able to understand the codification process, I move from pre-conventional to conventional. Do I agree with the rules? <coughs> Not necessarily. Do, I Do you think that Europeans are all in love with the traffic laws? Why do they obey them? They have to. Do you know what happens when Europeans you know what happens when Europeans come to the Middle East, especially Lebanon? They go, hey, no rules. And they just, do, they just do nothing. They think there's no rules. I was one of them. I was, it was 11 o'clock at night, and I drove against the one way in Humber Street. And people were yelling at me. I said, what? What do you mean I can't go against the one way? And the person who was with me said, there are rules about breaking rules. <laughs> which, is, which is true. I mean, the, we, we in the West, we obey the rules not because we love them, but because we don't want to get punished. So conventional thinking is not yet internalized. What does internalized mean? Internalized means it becomes part of who I am. I've noticed that there are some people in traffic who always obey the rules. Well, excuse me, where are you going? OK, and you need your book, too? You need all that paper? OK. OK. <laughs> Does that mean? OK, so uh, internalize. Internalize means that the rules become part of who I am. Some people think it's right when there's two lanes of traffic going down the hill or up the hill on the way home on Sunday to stay in the two lines. Other people think it's right to go around and around and around until we have the whole traffic blocked. Why do some people obey the, obey the rules even though they don't have to? How does this process work? How does an internalization of ethical norms work? Why do some people? OK, one is training. When I came to Lebanon, I noticed that my wife's family did not throw any of them, did not throw anything out the window in the car, none of them. And they said, well, it's just the way we were, we were brought up. When we were kids, we weren't allowed to throw stuff out, out the window. So I said, oh, wow, and where did your father get that idea? And I asked him, he said, why did you? He said, it's just the right thing to do. And I just didn't let the children throw things out the window. So now we have three generations not throwing stuff out the window. So it's practice. When I get in a car, I automatically buckle up. Because back in the 60s, there were no seat belts in the cars. My father went out and had them installed. So that we would learn as small children that you don't start the engine until everybody's got their seat belts on. And that was before the lights went bing, bing, bing. This was the 60s, right? Where, they, where the cars didn't even have padding on the front. When you hit your head, it was, me it was metal, right? Uh, but we had seat belts. No, no straps, but seat belts. So internalization can just be by practice, just by repetition, by reflex. But it can also be a product of what Hammarskjöld, Martin Luther King, Barnabe call the training through self-reflection. So you can arrive at this through being trained by your environment, or you can arrive at this through personal development. And the last level is an obviously post-conventional. And on the three levels, we have two each. The first level of pre-conventional is obedience simply because of punishment. How can I avoid punishment? The first level of pre-conventional. The second level is self-interest. What's in it for me? You'll start reflecting. Can I, how can I get some rewards? Very sophisticated animals, they're after treats. 
the way you how, does anybody know how to, to train a dog to sit or to come? You have a clicker, click, you say, sit, click, dog sits, reward. Sometimes a dog will come up and sit because it wants a reward. So this is the second level. I'm starting to get the pattern here, but it's still pre-conventional. The second is conventional. I know the norms. I know the int called interpersonal conformity. I obey, I conform to the rules because I now know them. I'm a good boy, I'm a good girl. My sister's one year younger than me, and she was always good, and I was always bad. So we, we had a good boy, bad, bad boy, good girl relationship. The second is authority and social order maintaining orientation. I like the people in power, I want to, them to, to be pleased with me. I live up to these norms because I want to be good in good with the authorities. And finally, the post-conventional. And on the post-conventional level, again, we have two. The one is something we call the social contract. We'll be dealing with this in detail. The contract between members of a group between members of a group who voluntarily get together and set rules. For example, after lunch on Sunday, in the summer you go up to the mountains, you all get together, you have lunch, and then some of the guys go out, some of the girls maybe, and you go out and you play football. Are there, any, are there ever, ever any fights about the rules in those games? No. no, because we're doing this because we want to. We're, we're doing this for the sake of fun. We're not doing this to compete and get rich. We all agree on how we're going to do it. We instinctively have a social contract. And the final and highest level is universal ethical principles. And here the point is universal. And this is what Hammerskill is talking about, the ultimate level that I develop core values that work in any given situation. And of course, the general secretary of the UN potentially would be a massively important global or universal leader. Now, how does, Hammers how does uh, Kohlberg go about testing this? You have the handout. And this will be the last point for today. You'll read about it in the reading as well, which is the whole thing's due for Thursday. It's called the Heinz Dilemma. The important thing for, Ham for Kohlberg is not what you do, but why you do it. And when you look at the Heinz Dilemma, it's mentioned, but you can also Google it. When you look at the Heinz Dilemma, it's a, it's a very classical ethical dilemma. Heinz's wife is very sick. And without the medication that she needs, her, her life, her survival chances are very low. It's spelled out here. So Heinz has two choices. He doesn't have the money for the medication. He has two choices. He can go steal it, thus his wife survives, or he can obey the law, his wife might die, his wife might die. They're both good, right? The one good is helping his wife to survive, and it's his wife after all. The other is obeying the law, protect, protecting the property rights of the company that has discovered this medication or the store that's selling it. So, when we, go, when we go over this, two more minutes, bear with me, let's look at why Heinz steals or doesn't steal. And remember, stealing or not stealing is not important. It's why he does the thing he does. So on the first level, the first stage, obedience, Heinz should not steal the medication because he will consequently be put in prison, which will mean he is a bad person. Very basic. I don't want to be in prison. Hurts. Or, Heinz should steal the medication because it's only worth $200 and not how much the druggist wanted for it. Heinz had even offered to pay for it, but was not stealing anything else. So, it's not really bad because 
that guy's a bad guy and we'll just steal it. He doesn't really deserve the thousands of dollars. He's asking for it. Very basic responding to stimuli. Somewhat higher, second stage, Heinz should steal the medic medicine because he will be much happier if he saves lives. Notice about, this is a certain level of abstraction here. It's not only saving his wife's life, it's saving lives. He'll be happier as a lifesaver. He saves his, uh, yeah, he will be, he'll be much more happier if he saves his wife's life and even he will serve a prison sentence. He's saving a life and he's making a balance, balanced decision. I'm taking one for the other. Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because prison is an awful place and he would be more likely, he would more likely languish in it in a jail cell than over his wife's death. So he would suffer more from being in jail than having his wife die. So he should, <laughs> what, 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 what's going to pain me more, a dead wife or a life in jail? Now these are very low levels of decision making. Okay, the rest of it is, is, is for next Thursday. See you.